go to our first question. Uh, and this first question is coming in from Keith. Uh, and he's got a question for June about Tom's costume. Keith, are you there? This is the bit where it either works or it doesn't. Keith? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, yes. Keith. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi, June. Uh, of course, you got what must have been the unenviable task of redesigning Tom's costume for the age. Oh, indeed, yes, it was. How fortunate. What a, what a treat. What a marvellous thing to do, to be able to do. It was fantastic. Yeah. And uh, I wondered, uh, I loved that burgundy colour. What made you go for that colour? Well, I it's a colour that I think has a look of nobility about it. Mm. It's very strong colour, very, very strong in its feelings. It has a, a slightly period look. It actually belongs to every period, that colour. And also it's... It stands out well. And Tom, because of his height and imposing personality, I knew that I could dress him from head to foot in the same colour. And it would never, ever wear him because Tom was, he would never, never be, uh, be defended by any costume. He would always uh, surmount any costume. And I knew that if I wanted to go to town and be outrageous and and do something really, really strong and striking, then Tom Baker was a fantastic opportunity to do that. And uh, I, the color you see, if you think about it, <clears throat> what are the colors? You see, it really narrowed itself down because it couldn't be black, it couldn't be white, it couldn't be green, it couldn't be blue because that, it's pretty obvious uniform colour. So in a way, every option was chopped off. And for me, that was the perfect colour for his costume, that it was stand out. Nobody else would be wearing that colour. Well, certainly, obviously, one wouldn't design things of that colour. Um, but it was a, it had many connotations, that colour. It clicks many thoughts, many ideas. For me, it it immediately the plum color, the maroon, the, the that for me um, was obvious almost from the beginning. I I didn't really need to think a great deal about it. But when I've been asked about it, as I many I, I very often have, I think well actually. It was the only colour that I could use for Tom. And um, it, at that stage, obviously, the costume had been well established and to make that significant change at that point um, was yes. certainly um, quite a strong um, design decision, I would say, from you. Well, yes, because he could wear it. I mean, it would be a very big risk to design that for anyone who was not up to Tom's imposing personality, his height, his strength, his personality, his style. He could surmount that and make it work. Where did the um, question mark um, symbols The come? question mark I particularly did not like. The question mark uh, was John Nathan Turner said, I want a question mark on the, the, the collar. And I said, oh, no gentleman would ever wear such a thing on their collar. And after all, the doctor is a gentleman with everything of every connotation of gallantry, strength, courage, all those things. And a, 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 a great question mark on the collar was something that I said, well, I, just, I don't like that. And he said, well, I think, can we have it in self color? Can we just have it embroidered in the same color in cream? And then you just see it when it catches the light. No, because uh, John Nace Turner said, look, we're broke. We need some money. Uh, we're going to market this shirt with the, the question mark on it and make a lot of money. And, and you know, we, this is commercial enterprise. And I said, oh, well, fine, in that case, 
obviously, yes. But I would not have chosen. I mean, I possibly, I think a self one would have worked very well and embroidered in the same color would have worked very well. Um, I didn't think it suited Tom Baker's personality, the character he was playing. I did not think that a big comic um, question mark worked. In my, I still don't think it worked. But I do as I'm told. <laughs> it's easier in the end. <laughs> uh, thank you for that very frank and honest answer, Jim. Um, and thank you for your question. <laughs> the actors will agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, not entirely, maybe. <laughs> well, Tom certainly didn't. <laughs> no. I'm going to. But then, then he is Tom Baker, and he surmounts everything like he surmounts his costume. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, I'm going to go to my next question now, and that's coming in from uh, one of our regulars, Beef. And here's a question for Nigel. Beef, are you there? Yeah, hi there. Uh, Nigel, outside of Doctor Who, you've had a legendary career in puppeteering. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested to know what it was like working on set on Labyrinth with some of the greats, especially Jim Henson, who was directing, and David Bowie as well in the cast. Yeah, interesting times. Uh, not long after, actually, not long after I did the Doctor Who, actually, I did Labyrinth, and um, I was there for uh, about, over a period of about three months, it was an absolutely fantastic experience. The sets that uh, were built at Elstree Studios were absolutely extraordinary. All of the films I did with the Henson Company have had wonderful sets, but these ones were particularly uh, fantastic. We had a um, we had a, a village that they built on the Star, the Star Wars stage uh, that was uh, went from well, it, it filled the whole stage. And to, to get an idea how big it was, when we had the rap party on it, they had a band playing at either end of the village and you couldn't hear one band uh, when you were in the other end of the village. So it was huge. And all of the sets, of course, were built in perspective to give you the feeling of the, the small people who were running around as well. It was just a great experience for me. Um, the, the main thing I did was the, um, the song where he throws the baby in the air, da, dance the magic dance. And... Um, we shot that for a week, but uh, it took us a week to shoot the sequence. And then a lot more stuff at the end, towards the end of the film, because I was working on Spitting Image at the time, so uh, I couldn't spend a lot of time there. But it was just a great experience, really, uh, to, do a, to do a fantasy film like that in the studio, as were the other ones I did for them, which was Muppet Christmas Carol, Muppet Treasure Island. Um, uh, they all were just extraordinary films to work on. Okay, great, great answer. And thanks, B, for the question. We're gonna move next to Joshua Duffy, who has a question for David. Joshua, are you there? Uh, oh, hello, David. Hi, Josh. Um, I, was, I was wondering, uh, what was it like returning to Doctor Who when you played the police captain in Army of Ghosts? Uh, it was a strange experience in many ways. Um, somebody just asked this question and I, I didn't do a reply. Maybe it was you. That the, the, the system, of course, by the time David Tennant's tenure had come around was totally different. In 1978, the BBC was a, a, a creative hub with the Acton Hilton, lots of things going on. You've got rehearsals. There was time for people. There were time for things to happen. But by the time you know, you're know you down the road and you have to go down to Newport to do the job, there are no rehearsals, you don't meet anybody. It's like, it's how television is made nowadays. You go in, you stand on your mark, you say the lines and you walk away. And hopefully somebody will put it together and make it look like something. But that's the way things are done nowadays in television. Um, so it was a very, very different experience. But of course, nice to be asked. Sadly, I, I didn't get to meet David Tennant though because I filmed my little insert um, <laughs> at, at the very last minute almost. I was there, I, I was taken down to Cardiff, put in a hotel, and then they say, we don't need you till the afternoon. So they'd send a car, you turn up at the studio in the afternoon, you go into makeup, you put the costume on, and then you sit for five hours until suddenly the film unit rush in with, you know, say, we've got 20 minutes to do this, quick, quick. And suddenly it's all havoc and it's all chaos and you do the lines and then suddenly it's over. 
and it's and it, that's it. So there was no meeting anybody. There was no rehearsal. It was just very instant acting. But you know, hey, nice to have a job. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Joshua. Good question. Um, we're going to go next uh, to Will, who has a question for um, Roz. Will, are you there to ask your question? Will with us? Okay. I'm going to ask Will's question then uh, on his behalf, Roz, to you. Um, and uh, Will is asking, what are your memories of working with the legendary um, Sir David Jason on Only Fools and Horses? Ah, we switched programmes. Yes, uh, we're switching around here. What, what, I've been very, very fortunate to work with two greats, and that's Tom and David. And um, David has to have been, and that our little our little bittersweet story that we did, the very first Christmas special, 1982, I think it was, the end of the first season. And I've never met anyone who was so generous. He, he could have been playing for all the laughs for coming for him, but he kept saying, let's do it this way because that's a very funny line that you're saying, and you, I want you to get the laugh there. And he, and he was such a, a, a craftsman and, and the fact that he, he'd come into the business very, very late, having been, I think he was an electrician. Um, I may have got that wrong, somebody correct me, but, but he, he did come into, into the business very late. And boy, he knew his stuff. Yes, it, it was, an again, a privilege, an absolute pleasure. One of my favorite jobs I ever did, I think. Um, and while we're on uh, sitcoms, um, David, can I just um, cut across and ask you a question about uh, your um, interpretation of um, a favourite character of mine, Sergeant Wilson, because you've got a chance to um, come back and do uh, some lost episodes of Dad's Army in 2007. Can you tell us a little bit about that? We did. It, that was such a gift, because the minute you mentioned Dad's Army and John LeMessurier, uh, it, there's a warmth just and it, it infuses people. There are such lovely memories of the original show. So when we took it out on the road, it was just a gift because the people came in knowing what they were going to get, happy to receive it. So all you had to do is open your mouth and say Jimmy Perry and David Croft's lines, and it all happened. But, but to to play, you know, one one couldn't do an imper I'm not an impersonator. So you try to find the essence of the John LeMessure of Sergeant Wilson. And after 10 minutes, you know, the, the audience in the theatre hopefully aren't resenting the fact you're not John LeMessure anymore and just accept you for who you are. And the shows really worked. We had a gift of a time. We did, we did once, uh, one tour called Dad's Army, The Lost Episodes in an all-male cast which was incredible. There were a couple of women's roles and a couple of the actors, you know, cross-dressed to play them. And then in the second tour, we did some other episodes. They were all TV episodes cobbled together by Jimmy Perry into a stage show. And it was one of the highlights of, of the last decade or the last two decades for me work-wise. It was just, they were terrific companies to work in. There was a warmth about the whole thing from the audiences. Just, you know, and I miss it terribly. I just wish they'd mount them again. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and the catchphrase, would you mind awfully? It's kind of like, it. <laughs> let's say. Um, OK, thank you for that memory. Uh, I'm going to uh, go next to Paul. Paul Burns is here, and he's got a question um, for you, Nigel, actually. So, Paul, are you there to ask your question? Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Um, Nigel, um, as well as being a huge Doctor Who fan, I was also a huge fan of Pipkins. Um, can you tell me um, about your time as Hartley Hare, because he's one of the icons of children's television? Well, uh, thank you for asking me about that. Yeah, I was doing that at the same time as I did the Doctor Who, actually, because it was all around the same time. So in, in the, uh, in, uh, it was a regular series I did for about nine years. I was very really lucky to, uh, to get a, a long run. Uh, preschool children's programme, uh, a great joy to do. Um, and in fact, I've just kind of recently uh, sort of gone back along that route with a new show called Monty and Co. 
uh, you may, if you if you saw if you ever saw Pipkins, you will maybe recognise a flavour of Pipkins in Monty and Co. It's on CBBS, um, and it was just a joy to do. And, and, and for an actor and for a performer generally, having a, a job that runs a long time and working with the same team is quite a rarity. And it was it's really good to be able to get to know the people that you're working with on that level. And in fact, I still know, in fact, I do know all of them today still. We've always kept in touch. And uh, so it's it was a great joy to do and a great joy to, to perform some extremely different characters within the same programme, which is something I love. So um, <laughs> it was, thank you for asking me that. <laughs> um, I certainly, I grew up, um, Pipkins was a big part of my lunch times. <laughs> Um, I was amazed. I checked earlier. There were three hundred. There's been three hundred and thirty-three episodes. I think on its yeah, website. yeah. Over over about nine, ten years, we'd shot for yeah, which I uh, came as quite a surprise. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to go next to Ellie. Ellie has a question for June. Um, Ellie, are you there? Uh, hello. 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 <laughs> um, so my question is for June and. I said, we all know that you had a fabulous spin-off uh, or cameo in a spin-off called Class. Um, would you ever want to have a cameo role in Doctor Who and what would your character be? I don't know, really. I, I was quite surprised, you know. I, I looked at myself and I thought, good heavens, who's that old woman, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a bit, so, it took me aback. Well, of course I would. As a matter of fact, I did audition um, for a part in Doctor Who, and it was in the the Mummy, the one about the Mummy, and it was ja Janet did. Um, I'm just thinking of the actress who played it. She did. I mean, forget it. She just did the most wonderful performance. It was simply marvelous. Um, yes, because I did start as an actor. You see that that. And uh, because I didn't make enough money, I, I decided as I was a designer that I would do a tour. So I did a tour of Blythe as a designer and the director was actually going into television um, at ATV at Elstree and asked me to come with him. And I, I stayed in costume. I stayed in costume design ever afterwards until I left the BBC in the early nineties. And again, you know, we spend money like there's no tomorrow. I thought, right, okay, I've got to make some money here. <laughs> I've got to go back to acting. So that is how and why. So I do both, really. <laughs> um, thanks, Ellie, for your question there. Um, Roz, um, I'm going to come back to you. I'm, I'm hoping you've got Olive there. I can, I'm can. i hoping oh. Olive's somewhere close, but probably not by the look of it. <laughs> I think there's a few of, there's a few Olive fans out here in the audience um, who may have met you already. Uh, Olive um, is uh, Ross's little 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 dog, and we, we can't she not is. have a Zoom without Olive coming on screen. There she is. Look, say hello, to Jason. You know, dogs can't see 2D. This is the problem. You could you could speak to her, but she they can't see you if you're on a screen. Oh, how weird. Oh, I I have been told this and. I, I think it works because when you, you try saying hello, David, or calling her, and she Olive, probably... hello, hello, Olive. No, nothing. <laughs> Here she is, everybody. Well, Olive's joined us anyway, so that's great. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, when, you, when you think about the fact that um, BBC's had to change a lot, and obviously the, the way television's changed, you've said it yourself, David. You know, you came back and worked in in the modern series. You've all you've all been associated with BBC over the years. I mean, you know, it's it's positive. I think that we can we can say after all these years that the organisation's still there. It's played an integral part. But every a lot of things in television have, have changed. Uh, where where do you see the, the, the sort of where do you see the, the sort of direction that the BBC should go in? Oh, are you asking me, sir? Yeah, I mean, anyone. I'll take Ross. I'll take your answer first off. No, somebody else answer that. Okay, <laughs> David. I'll have you have to think. On that I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, not having worked for the BBC in ages, only receiving the royalty checks nowadays. Um, 
I don't really know. Although, having said that, there's a lot of good stuff on the television, and some of it seems to emanate via the BBC. I mean, I'm eager that after we finished our session here, I'm going straight into the lounge, getting a glass of wine, and watching the next series of Line of Duty. Oh, now, me too. There's, <laughs> yes. there's, there's yes. so much. There's so much good stuff on television, but it's not shot in the old Doctor Who way. That's all. I mean, the way things happen now, as I said before, there's, I don't think there's any rehearsal. They set the cameras up. They maybe do a, a, a wide shot and walk it all through, and then do individual cutaways. But there's there's no time, I think, for character development. You hope the script does that for you. But then, if the script is well written, it will do it for you. All you've got to do is say the lines, make sure they can be heard. That's a bugbear of mine. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so uh, I don't know where the BBC is going. It's going independent, but that's been that's been there since Margaret Thatcher's day. Jason, I've just thought of something to say. Go on, Ross. Okay. It, it might not be um, exactly the answer to what you were saying, but for, for a while, until they stopped it because of security issues, um, I and, and some other actors were privileged or whatever to do uh, tours of Broadcasting House, um, which is the new building. So we started off just taking the staff round in hard hats and high vis jackets and boots and things when they were still building it. And then eventually it was open to the public. And I don't know if any of you out there have seen W1A, uh, which was that terrific uh, comedy uh, and uh, a, a, an awful lot of people were in it um, but if you have seen it that is exactly it's so brilliantly written because that is exactly what it's like behind the scenes you know with the meeting rooms and they have to have a meeting about everything and it, it, it's all terribly corporate um, but it, very enjoyable doing those tours because you, you learned a lot going behind the scenes so um that's just a little thought that I have. It, you uh, know, one of the things, one of the things we used to have as retirees was we taking our ID card, we were able to go into any BBC premises once we'd left the BBC, which was wonderful because you could go and have lunch, you could go and have a drink in the club, everything. And then they decided that it was a security risk. Whether they thought we were half daft and, and, and they, you know, somebody might talk us into taking it. Well, maybe, I don't know. Whether, but it was a very great deprivation to me, um, very much so. I, I did miss it very much. I could be taken in there by someone who worked at the BBC, but us uh, retirees were no longer welcome. And I thought, what? I've given 30 odd years of my life to this. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> I, I think one of the reasons they stopped the, the public tours was because the newsroom is based at New Broadcasting House. Oh yes, of course. On occasion, I think a couple of people posed as members of the public on a tour and then somehow slipped away and got into the newsroom, which of course... Oh, a little girl did, didn't she? Climbed under the desk. There was all sorts of who are Yes, I remember. Yes, of course, it makes sense, really. It just, I did miss it. <laughs> I know. I but times it. change, and we have to change with them. Yeah. They, they do indeed. Um, Nigel, anything to add to that before I... Um... As I'm currently producing a programme that the BBC are buying, I'm not going to comment. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, very wise. Okay, we definitely don't want any comments there. Then. Everything is wonderful. The BBC um, is wonderful. Is wonderful. Absolutely. I love it. Absolutely. Amazing. I'm an exile ever since I left the BBC. Rachel, is it fully cast yet? <laughs> I'll talk to you, David. <laughs> We're acting as auditions. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna bring us, I'm gonna bring us to a close. Um key to time is a season that um it was it was a, a, a start of a slightly different direction for, for Doctor Who at that point. We had our new producer, Graham Williams. Um, you know, it it brings it's great for us when we, we can watch it. I've just wanted one last um, look back from each of you. Is there anything in particular that stands out um, for each of you on your time 
uh, on Doctor Who. And um, I'm going to start with June. Is there any one particular thing, June, that, that stands out? Well, I mean, obviously, of course, the, the huge privilege of designing Tom Baker's costume and, and his belief in me and his, his feeling that I would show him to advantage, which I have always wanted actors to look their best. And if I could say there was anything I wanted, it was for actors to look their very best within the character they're playing and for their costume to help them to reach their role. Thank you, June. Uh, David. Um, I miss the BBC in its old form. People are commenting now at the moment about it was, its heyday was the 60s and the 70s, when it was a creative centre, when the Acton Hilton had, June, you might remember me, six or seven floors of rehearsal rooms with four rehearsal rooms on each floor. So there were 24 or whatever that is, 28 productions potentially operating at any one time over the whole spectrum of him from Morecambe and Wise, Dick Emery, to Doctor Who, to drama. And it was just thrilling to be part because this, this energy was infective. You know, you, it was just a great time to be working at the BBC. Oh, indeed it was. Um, Roz, final word from you. I'm just going along with David on this one, the Acton Hilton, yes, that is the thing. I remember going up in the lift when we were rehearsing Doctor Who with Ronnie Corbett. I didn't, I've never met him before, but it was like, I'm in the lift with Ronnie Corbett. <laughs> you, know, you did, you felt this, it was, it was just buzzing. Yeah. It was. Buzzing's a good word. Mm. And finally, Nigel, one last uh, word. I have to echo the same thing. You know, the Acton Hilton was a great place to be. But I think, uh, apart from all the other things we've talked about tonight, one of the clever things I thought, and this goes back to what June was saying a little earlier, about, I think it was Ken Legend that designed the set on, on the... Uh, on, oh, was it uh, Ken? Right. I think so. Um, the clever, clever use of the sets, because he took oh, yeah. one set, and then two weeks later, he, it would be completely redressed, look completely different, but was basically the same set. Oh, and I, it, I thought it. what they must have done on the budget that they had was just remarkable. Well, that's, yes, we did. I think we did miracles with, yeah. with the money we had. And yeah. we used every penny to advantage. We certainly didn't waste it. No, no, no. And one abiding memory I have of the Hilton, of the, of the act in Hilton, was John Gielgud, laying the table for lunch while they were all queuing up to get the dinner at the <laughs> counter when I was doing a, a Shakespeare. I mean, that was um, just amazing. And uh, that is something about the Acton Hilton I do remember. I feel like there's a series in the making here somewhere. There's a script that's been unwritten here. The story <laughs> of the Acton Hilton. Oh, the, yes. All the stories and all the intrigue and mystery behind the scenes the BBC is waiting to be written there. Um, I'm going to thank each of my guests um, and I would actually like each and every one of you out there in our audience to give a show your, show your appreciation to all of our panel this evening I think who's I'm sure you'll agree have entertained us fabulously well over the last um, hour or so.